are very honored to have among us Kent uh, Redford, who is a principal of the Archipelago Consulting based in Portland, Maine. And his firm was designed to help individuals and organizations improve their practice of conservation. Prior to uh, Archipelago Consulting, Kent spent 14 years at the Wildlife Conservation Society in New York and five years in the Nature Conservancy. He started his career with a decade on the faculty at the University of Florida, and his interests lie in wildlife, parks, and the intersection of novel technologies and the future of conservation. And I know, I know that he's, he's been contracted to write a book on the very subject he will be talking about tonight. So please help me welcome Ken to the podium. Good evening. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I, I would like to thank uh, President Herbert and Provost Sheldon for uh, inviting me, uh, particularly Professor Peterson and Professor Majid, my, my host, for this evening. Now, I, it may seem odd to you that somebody with my background and with the title and the subject of this matter would be included in a humanities presentation. And in fact, I consider myself a stepchild of the humanities and would like to try and assure you, the family of the humanities, that I do belong within your family. <laughs> and I hope that by the end of the event that you'll see that, in fact, what I'm talking to you about this evening is very much a part of the humanities in the sense that we think about humanities as the study of the quality or the conditions of being human, or what some people would call human nature. So it causes you to pause to think about that human nature. Because the duality within human nature is really the subject of what I want to focus on here today. Nature, as a term was called by the liter literary theorist, um, uh, Raymond Williams as the most complicated word in the English language. It started out being juxtaposed with the supernatural or the divine, and it is now in our day and age come to be seen as opposed to human. So in fact, the tension between humans and nature is a humanities topic. So be with me. Let me into the family by the time I'm done here. So just, just go with this. You'll see, you'll see where we're going to go. So I was raised to think that nature was something entrancing, something that was outside humanity. Uh, and nature was in need of conserving from destruction. The destruction, of course, originated with people. Because people were bad for nature. So to save nature, you had to remove humans from it. And then nature would thrive without human interference. Management of nature, in this case, in the way I was raised, meant no management at all, leaving things be. It was really in my uh, early graduate career that I began to understand that that view that, with which I'd been raised was not the appropriate one to move forward, that humans, in fact, were not separate, but, it, but were deeply intertwined with one another and engaged in ways that we tend not to think about, but I'm going to illustrate a few of them here. So there was no market for watermelons in Japan. Does anybody know why? Small refrigerators. You ever try to put a watermelon in a small refrigerator and you see how inefficient. So what do you do? You, you make watermelons that fit in small refrigerators. How about this? Lyre birds found um, in the Australasian region are superb mimics. There are lyrebirds now who are singing the song of chainsaws that they've added to their vocabulary. Or this particular poignant one, this frog, which specializes in things like fireflies that blink, has mistaken a blinking Christmas light for a firefly and is forever um, impaled, if you will, on this string of Christmas lights. Or hermit crabs, which no longer have sufficient shells and are condemned to have to use the discarded flotsam of plastic in order to find a home. Here an example uh, uh, that comes from Europe. Great tits you see pictured here in this image. Um, on your left is its song of a great tit in, the, in nature. And on the right is the song of a great tit in an urban environment. All of that red, green, and blue noise you see at the bottom is the sound that we make that you would hear out our window in Portland every morning. You notice that the birds have had to raise the pitch of their singing in order to be able to hear each other over the sound of the jet port. 
We also find ourselves in these kind of odd situations where the raising of baby pandas requires the attempt by humans to look like pandas. I, I, I don't know that you'd have to be very smart to not think of that as a female panda, but apparently it, it works. Um, or in this case, even at its most extreme, perhaps those of you are familiar with a particular cultural phenomenon found in this country called furries, in which people believe they should have been born as an animal and not a human. And they have conventions in which you choose the animal that you feel should have been your birth animal. And then you attend and only vocalize in the sounds of the, of the animal that you believe you should have been. The particularly interesting here is the cheetah, right? I mean, what is, what is the Star Wars? <laughs> What's he doing there? Boy, there's somebody. Anyway, I, he was allowed to be a furry. So these are meant to amuse and pique your interest. They make a serious point. And I'll continue this here, another, because so many of the humanities originate from Italy. So these are the Marmory Falls, um, considered to be one of the most beautiful wall, uh, falls in Italy, uh, draining, which are the Velino River falling uh, and these uh, were built by the Romans in 271 BC to drain a marshland above. And they deliberately created these waterfalls, which are now viewed as amongst the most beautiful aspects of nature. This way in which humans have changed the natural world for our own purposes it, it does not originate from Western societies and only in Europe. This is an area where I worked in lowland Bolivia. Uh, this is flooded grassland, and you see the forest island in the background. This is an island that, you know, we, I, when I worked in the area, it was just a place where you'd find certain kinds of animals, and that was just above the flooding. So I suppose what Scarborough is going to look like in a few years, uh, minus the oxen, although who knows? There may be a market for oxen. But I. So this forest island turns out to be entirely built on human refuse, broken pottery burnt charcoal, animal bones, all of that was constructed by people. And it now is an inextricable part of the ecology of this system. But it is entirely of, of human origin. This dynamic plays forward into our lives that we live in now in a really poignant study that was published in 2012. These people looked at the species that are listed under the US government's Endangered Species Act, 82% of those species or populations will require eternal human management in order to survive. You can't simply separate humans from nature and have them survive. In this picture, you see the, the bird and the Kirtland's warbler. And in the other image, you see what we are doing to the forests of jack pine in the northern peninsula of Michigan in order to keep those birds there. Those trees are planted every 10 years and then cut down and then replanted in order to keep this bird going. And then, of course, over this whole thing, casting a pall and affecting it all is climate change, which largely has a signature uh, which originates many, many years ago from human exploitation. This poignant picture, it's a term that I use many times for these images, is of the New York Aquarium after uh, the Hurricane Sandy. And you see in the exhibit uh, a fish swimming in salt water. And in front of the aquarium, you see the, the ocean, which has invaded the aquarium on its own. The extent to which humans have influenced the natural world has, in fact, gotten itself a proper name. Some of you may or may not have heard of the Anthropocene. So this is a geological epic, geological epic in which the signature of humans is going to be evident in the geological record probably long after humanity is gone. So I was raised with this simple dichotomy that we started with, which is that people were bad and nature was good, and you just needed to separate them. And this turns out to be not only incorrect, but not functional in terms of trying to conserve nature. We live in a hybrid world in which we are already beginning to see these pra hybrid practices of conservation. So this is a, a set of activities that are particularly common, not common per se, but are exemplified in Europe where the introduction of domestic animals, in this case the horses, they are, they are introduced to become wild horses. So there is no management provided to them, with the exception of, of shooting them when they're extremely sick, um, as a way of trying to recapture the fact that during the Pleistocene, there was a wild horse that used to live in Europe, this, this photo being from Netherlands. And this is an extraordinary image. This is a test for any of you who are who know your mammals, you will find a dissonance in this image. You see a tiger, 
and you know tigers are from Asia, and you see an African antelope. So there are no China tigers left. In, there are no South China tigers left in southern China for obvious reasons because it's all full of people. There are South China tigers left, left in zoos. So there is a, a really extraordinarily quixotic attempt to, to train South China tigers so that they could be wild tigers again by teaching them how to be predators. But of course, you can't do that in China, so it's being done in South Africa where these people have rented a space and are allowing the tigers to then hunt native antelope from South Africa. Again, brought to you with this attempt to deal with the uh, horrible afflictions facing uh, African animals, there's an Australian effort to bring rhinos out of, out, of, out of Africa and to put them into Australia in order to try and save them from all being killed for their horns uh, due to the tra trade in rhino horn. Because this is a humanities program, we need a couple of humanities examples. So here is Moby Dick written in emojis. So you can, in fact, read that in case you don't, in case you want to be reading that many pages in emojis. But I just wanted to be able to show you that this is a kind of hybrid thing that we're looking at. And in an example which I find just so extraordinary, it is so distressing that I don't even know what to say about it. So I'm going to describe it to you and share my distress. If you download on your phone this great app, you can write on the sky. And anybody who walks by and has that app on their phone and holds it up will see the skyline of New York with I love you, babe, or what a view, or anything else that you choose to write on it. We are defacing the sky uh, for a small nominal fee uh, through the Apple App Store. So amusing, serious. We have now created a set of what are called the term of art being novel ecosystems. These are places where species and ecological processes that have never been together before are now there. Puerto Rico is a great example where there is an endangered tree in Puerto Rico. It's endangered because it has large seeds and they're not, the birds that used to spread them are now extinct. Well, somebody introduced monkeys onto Puerto Rico, which they have, no, they have no business being there. They're now moving those seeds and the tree is all right, thanks to this um, new animal. So there are a set of scientists and conservationists who are seriously entering this field and talking about taking responsibility for trying to use these hybrid technologies to move forward to try to conserve what, it, what we mean, I don't know, by the natural world. So these include things like directed evolution. There's a group of people who thinks that we are going to lose the majority of coral reefs. I think most of us would agree. And they think that by altering the genetic composition of corals to be able to deal with warmer oceans, we may be able to save coral reefs. If you don't like that, these are 3D printed reefs. They're printed in the 3D printer, and then they're put out in the ocean, onto which the larvae from uh, coral reef things will settle, and they will make their home on the plastic printed, and you end up with a hybrid reef that at least looks like a reef. And if that isn't far enough for you, one of the model organisms for genetics and, and lab research is this roundworm called C. elegans. There is now a digital version of it on which experimenting is done. So it, they're not even using an actual animal. They're using a digital representation of it and conducting experiments in the digital world. So the point is clear here that, that humans and nature have become so commingled that it's hard to know exactly what it is you're supposed to conserve in some of these settings that I've described to you. The, still, the, the conservation community is, as usual, lagging behind in much of this. And it, it's still stuck. We, me and my people, are still stuck with this distinction. Are you in favor of biocentric conservation, that is, nature for nature's sake, or are we in favor of anthropocentric conservation in which we need to conserve the nature that humans value, be it for clean water or clean air or because you want fish or, or for whatever reason? The case I want to make to you in the time remaining is that that is an insufficient and inappropriate way for us to be moving forward as we consider conservation. And that, in fact, we have in front of us as a as a set of societies, a novel operating space for conservation, a place that is not represented in that dichotomy that I just described to you. And what I am here to try and argue tonight is that that space is filled with the field of synthetic biology. 
for those of you who aren't up on what synthetic biology, it's got many different definitions. The one I think that is easiest is it's the application of science, technology, and engineering to facilitate and accelerate the design, manufacture, and modification of genetic materials in living organisms. In other words, we are altering DNA for human purposes and putting it back into animals and plants so they will do things the way we want them to do things. And this can be done in one of two broad categories. Most commonly until now is altering the DNA outside of a cell and then putting that DNA back into the cell and hoping that the cell will say, oh, okay, I had the wrong instruction book. I'll now use the new one you gave me and create a uh, create the products that you have asked it to do with the new DNA you've given it. Rising rapidly and probably going to replacing this is the second category, which is to actually go into the living cell and alter the DNA itself within the operating cell and causing that cell to be able to then do things that the cell never in its entire evolutionary history would have done, thanks to human intervention. You're going to be hearing a number of examples that talk about what you can do with using these technologies. The thing that you have, may have read or heard about is this CRISPR technology, which is a particularly extraordinarily accurate way to modify DNA at the, at the single base pair level. Very precise. What does this mean? This is a colleague who wrote this book, which was published a number of years ago, but I still think is one of the best. It's called Biology is Technology. What is happening is the engineers have discovered biology, and they are saying, biology is really sloppy, takes a long time. What it needs is a good, and this is the quote I use, they want to reboot biology so that it will start behaving more the way engineers would like it to. This is happening over a very broad front. And one of the things I want you to leave here with is not only the technologies, but the fact that you better get used to this, because it's going to be coming if it isn't here already. So it's all over the world. That's the first point. Second point, these changes are happening very rapidly. So here's a curve. The blue line is what is called Moore's Law, named after Gordon Moore, who's one of the founders of Intel. And he said that the, that the um, the mechanics within the, the, the components that form transistors that make up your cell phone are going to increase in power and decrease in size every number of years. That blue line shows you the speed at which that change has happened. So my phone or your phone is the result of Moore's law. So it has changed. You know, the, the usual thing you hear is that the first spacecraft that landed on the moon has less computer power than your phone in your pocket. And that's due to the change thanks to Moore's law. Also on this graph are orange and yellow curves, which are reading and writing DNA. These are the two key technologies. These are changing at a faster rate than Moore's law. So if it is correct that the change that we are going to see in these genetic technologies is going to be at a rate that's faster than Moore's law, then you, can, you, can, you have experienced the kind of change and the speed and the, that it will bring into your life. So this is not just small potatoes stuff. The latest numbers from 2012, 324 billion of their gross domestic product, product in the United States was from products that were um, made using uh, synthetic biology, the majority of them in crops and in industrial. We'll talk about both of those things in a moment. <clears throat> this is the target for a lot of that activity. You may know that there's a fragment of every uh, barrel of oil that is used to make plastics. All of those things you see featured around that barrel, be it from, from uh, Legos to stuffed animals to umbrellas to sneakers to soccer balls, all of those things are coming from the barrel of oil. The synthetic biologists have targeted every single one of these products and want to bring it to you made by yeast and bacteria and not from barrels of oil. How about the changes in agriculture front? This, to me, is one of the most extraordinary things. So three billion people depend on rice right now. It is the most important staple crop in the entire world. It, unfortunately, if you're a human, um, evolved with a le of, uh, an inefficient form of photosynthesis called C3. There is a more efficient form of photosynthesis called C4, which is found in most plants. This project, with billions of dollars, is to change the photosynthesis of rice. 
The most basic aspect of being a plant is going to be changed if they're successful. If that works, this is what you may expect to see. 50% greater yield, half the water, less fertilizer, and less contribution to climate change. Thanks to going in and changing the DNA, the very basic structure of what makes this plant a plant. How about this one? Opening November in New Jersey is a factory called Modern Meadow that is making leather produced by yeast. So leather comes from collagen. Collagen is what's in your skin, and when you're my age, starts to sag, and you're all get worried about that, but enough about me. The, the collagen is, forms skin, forms leather. The genetic mechanism for creating collagen has been taken out of cattle and put into yeast. There are now large fermenters in New Jersey. You can order the color, the size, and the flexibility of leather, and it is brought to you thanks to yeast. Never saw a cow. So not only are we now in a position to be able to change these DNA, the DNA at remarkable levels, this happened just uh, November 29th of last year. And that was to insert a blank into the DNA. So previously, all of the, all of the chemical portions of the DNA, there are four of them that are used to build all of DNA. And each one in sequence codes to make a particular kind of protein, et cetera. If you ever took biology, you'd remember that. What happens if you can insert a fifth and a sixth one that are not coded to do anything? You could then code those to do what you wanted. This is the first experiment that has showed the inserting of blank codons into cells which then reproduced and carried that forward, creating a blank in this cell that can be used to program to produce something else later on. This is not just taking place in labs. This is one of the other points I want to make to you. This, uh, rather, it's not taking place only in expensive private university labs or large industrial um, private labs. There are public labs. You can pay $100, $200 a month. Maybe I think it's less than that. Anyway, I haven't paid that. And you can walk in, and you can use some of the best equipment that's available to experiment with making novel life forms. Any one of you could do that if you wanted to join a community lab. There's one in Boston. Take the Concord coach, get off, take the silver line, find the community lab, and start making bacteria that nature hasn't seen before. So this is from uh, two or three years ago. These are the number of community labs. There are now 77 of these ar around the entire world. So if you, you don't like Concord coach lines, you've seen the movies seven times, you're tired of that. Um, and you have $800, you can buy one of these machines off Amazon. You can do it in your own home. Start to get yogurt. That's a good way to start, because it's got all those live cultures in it. You can start changing the, the DNA and bacteria. You can start in your kitchen making forms of life that are never been seen in the entire history of life on the face of Earth. Any one of you can with $800. So and it's not just us guys. So here, there's a, there's a competition called IGEM, the International Genetically Engineered Machine. Right? Well, it doesn't matter. The point is, 2016, 295 teams from 42 countries and high school students, high school students. So if you're in college, you're already old when it comes to this. So you've got kids in high school who are learning these technologies, learning these techniques, and setting out to make products to make novel forms of life. Look how happy they all are. <laughs> Now, if you, and even they are old. Thanks to Pamela, my wife, who found this. This was 29th of November last year, the first kids section of the New York Times, in case you saw it. Look what's here. A kids section. DNA is in every living thing. Get your scissors. It's time to mess with it. So we are growing a culture of people who, re, who, who are going to have a very different view about what DNA is, and what life is, and what our opportunities, obligations, rights are to mess with it, with scissors. All of this has gone on largely without any consideration for the impact on the natural world. So we're going to pivot here in the talk to start a little bit more on that front. So I've been involved in helping try to have a few set of meetings um, over the last four, four years to try and bring together these fields. And most of the conservation community says, I don't see why it should be any business of mine. I'm busy trying to save the world, save the alewives, save the pandas, save the whales. 
this stuff has got nothing to do with me. And I hope you, if you ever hear that from somebody after this talk, you will be able to tell them why they'd better be worried about it. So this is what is drawn, this is the bijou version of this, which has drawn most of the journalists' attention and also the ethicists. There is the opportunity to revive extinct species through the application of these technologies. And here are two images that are particularly poignant to us, um, the chestnut. Now, if you look at that image, I want you to notice, um, I don't know if I have a pointer here. That's a person. So those were trees that were the most important um, canopy tree in, in eastern US forests for a very long time. Until 1904, the first chestnut, the Chinese chestnut blight showed up in the Bronx Zoo in New York. And within a matter of decades, all reproductive chestnuts, most all reproductive chestnuts are gone. Except that they're now being brought back because of the introduction of a wheat gene into chestnuts, which, which then allows them to be resistant to this um, Chinese chestnut blight. There's another effort in just a breeding one. We can talk about that later if you want. The point is also up here is, is a passenger pigeon. This was the most numerous bird on the face of the earth until our ancestors in this country shot them all. It, you, the flocks were so large, it took three days. Three days for a flock of these passenger pigeons to cross over. Then the last one died. They'd all been shot and fed and eaten and fed to pigs. Now there's an effort to actually use the DNA to bring um, these back. How about this? There's also uh, early attempts now to take genetic diversity that has been lost from living animals, capture it from preserved cells or preserved specimens in museums, and reintroduce that lost genetic diversity into existing animal populations. Here we have a case um, in Hawaii which had an, an amazing proliferation of these beautiful honey creepers. More than half of which have gone extinct because of avian malaria. So there, you, there were no mosquitoes and there was no malaria in Hawaii. They were both brought to Hawaii thanks to European ships and sailors. And now avian malaria has, been, has eliminated half the honeycreeper species. There is, an, a, there is an interesting discussion going on about trying to genetically alter the mosquitoes in Hawaii so that they cannot transmit malaria to try to preserve the last of these wonderful birds. We've already talked a little bit about this, corals. So how are we going to try to allow corals to resist a warming and acidifying ocean? It may be possible, some people have speculated and are experimenting to turn on and off certain of their genes. Maybe they can survive in these oceans. How about degraded land? Most people don't realize that there's somewhere between seven and 12% of the Earth's terrestrial surface which is no longer a place where life can grow. These are places that have been so badly uh, desertified or overgrazed or, or abused. What happens if we could bring that back? Imagine a project in which you could restore to productivity both for nature and humans 10% of the Earth's surface. Maybe this could be done with these new technologies. Or this one, this number is dated, but it hasn't gotten any better. 271 million pounds of pharmaceuticals into the waterways in the US in 2009. Think about it. 270 million pounds. I just take a little pill. What's the problem? Well, each one of you takes one twice a day. And by the way, caffeine passes through as well. And so this is going into our water. What happens if we could, in the water treatment plants or beforehand, actually custom build bacteria that would remove the pharmaceuticals and so that they wouldn't be entering the, the water and then the ocean? How about invasive species? The, everybody's least favorite, Burmese python, which is taking over the Everglades. These medium and large mammal populations, the deer, the raccoons, the rabbits, in the Everglades have decreased over 92% as a result of being eaten by Burmese pythons. That's in the last two decades. Nobody knows how to get rid of them. Or rats and mice, one of the major scourges on oceanic islands, eating the, the young, the chicks, and the eggs of ocean birds, oceanic birds, of these mice and rats. So this is a technology that is now being experimented with. Um, natural breeding, you, that's what you're kind of used to. That's what you explain to your kids, but maybe not without the mice. Or maybe you use the mice. 
I think we had gerbils. I don't know. We used it. With. So you have the mommy and you have the daddy, and then they have two boys and two girl babies. Well, what happens if you change the genetic structure of the female so that she only, only produced males? So this is there's a feature in the genetic code called the gene drive. We can talk more about it if you care later, in which the the mated pair produces only males. So if if you can get this into a wild oceanic population without killing a single mice, mouse, or rat, you will cause the population to go extinct without ever, without ever causing a direct harm to an animal. So I'm a big fan of the microbiome. I don't, again, I don't know. If you got up this morning and looked in the mirror, looking back at you were 10 times more cells that are not human than are human. You ought to be thinking about that next time you look in the mirror. These are all the bacteria and fungi and viruses that live in and on and around us, 500 species in your mouth, all the rest of it. Major, major discoveries coming out about the way human health is, in fact, mediated by the microbiome. So it may be that we could actually achieve some conservation successes, not by changing the, ge the genetic structure of the animals that concern us, but of changing their microbiome instead. And needless to say, there's a lot of this work going on for human medicine as well. In fact, there are now elite athletes, and you can purchase pills that have their microbiome and taste it, take it in case you thought that that would allow you to dunk or swim faster or whatever it is. So all of this sounds like, oh, wow, amazing, really weird. It should also be raising a set of significant concerns in you if it hasn't already, particularly in the humanities. Um, these include, I don't want to just, talk, just briefly touch on a few of them. Uh, nature's services may be synthesized. You, you've read a lot about why we need to, or maybe you have, read a lot about why we need to conserve forests, the Amazon and what have you, because it's where the carbon is. Well, what happens if you can do what is done in this place, which is to take poplar trees and double the carbon sequestration by altering the DNA? And then I say to you, I'll just buy the Amazon, I'll cut it down, sell the wood, and I'll plant a plantation of trees that'll double the carbon sequestration there. Sounds like a good deal. If you want carbon sequestration, I'll sell it to you, and you don't have to worry about the forest anymore. Well, this is the kind of, of dilemma we may be heading ourselves into. This is the biggest thing that should worry you and is the biggest thing that worries me, which is when we make these changes and those organisms with that genetic, altered genetic materials hit natural selection, a bad winter, a good winter, a flood, a fire, or anything else, what is going to happen to that genetic change? Is it going to be modified? And in what unexpected ways might that occur? Because much of what we're talking about in terms of conservation applications require them to be widely dispersed. So this is a map that shows the distribution of this horrible white nose syndrome, which has been killing colonies, colony nesting bats. And it started in southern Canada. And uh, within 10 years, you can see its distribution. If we want to try to use a synthetic biology approach to address that fungus, we're going to have to create something that spreads very widely with bats. Well, geez, that ought to worry you. Now, if you happen to have been trained as a Marxist, and I know my host has a whole section of his bookcase on Marxist, you might also be worrying about ownership. So it's fine if the kids are doing it and community labs are doing it. But what happens if I save black-footed ferrets and then I patent the saved ferret? What, what does that mean to have ownership of endangered species, or the genomes of endangered species. What does it mean if you have ownership of crops? Oh, we already know what that looks like. That looks like Monsanto, which is the word that's on every tip of everybody's tongue. Um, so this is a problem, and it's a society-wide problem that, that we're in the middle of dealing with. Then unknown land impact. So the background picture here is of a palm oil plantation, major reason for deforestation in uh, Southeast Asia and increasingly in the, in the western uh, band of the Amazon. So what happens if we could produce oil palm, I mean palm oil, from bacteria and we didn't need to, to cut rainforests and grow, and grow the, the trees themselves? Sounds great. Oh, wait, what are we going to do with the yeast that's going to be producing that palm oil? Oh. 
Look at that picture. That's a green algae production facility in Hawaii. So because you, because you can only grow algae at a fairly narrow band because they have to be exposed to the sunlight, you need a lot of area. So are we simply going to be replacing oil palm plantations with al algal raceways, which is what these things are called? I don't know. But we ought to be thinking about that before we dive too deeply in. Then there's a, 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 a deeply Marxist critique of this, which has to do with the ownership and with the people who are going to pay the cost in the long run because they're the people who always have paid the cost in the long run. And those in the past have been the rural poor, Increasingly, the rural poor have become urban poor. But what happens when we start messing with these production systems in terms of the lives and livelihoods of those folks? We need to be thinking about that as well. So we have these possibilities. We have these things starting. I want to give you a few examples of what I think are some of the more optimistic technologies that are being brought up. So this is a company called Knip Bio. So methane, you know, flares off from oil wells at and it's typically burned, and it creates, it's one of the significant greenhouse gases. Well, these guys have engineered a bacteria so that it eats methane. So the methane is run through the water, the bacteria are in the water, they capture the methane and metabolically convert it into sugars, which are then harvested and turned into feedstock for fish aquaculture. So you're decreasing carbon, you're decreasing uh, greenhouse gases. You're removing the pressure from wild fish stock to raise um, farmed fish. And you're decreasing the direct pressure on fish by producing more in agriculture settings. How about this one? These are plants which change their growth pattern and color in the presence of TNT in soils, trinitrotoluene. So Think about this. You, you, I mean, I can't, I don't know the number, but there's some gazillion number of landmines that are still out there in the world and still the source of ongoing horrible death and injury to, to rural dwellers. What would happen if you could take a drone and just plant these plant seeds all over the mine fields and you actually could identify the mine location by the changing in color of that plant? It hasn't been done yet, but it's been done for trinitrotoluene, so perhaps it could be done for other chemicals. Now, uh, if, if um, because you all had had a drink before the talk, I can't say if we had a drink after the talk, I'd tell you the full story about this. But mm -hmm. So the short version is, Pamela offered me a present for my birthday, and we I wanted to try going fly fishing off the coast of Maine. And we ended up with a guide who used to work for Patagonia, and, and he he just looked at us and thought, oh, these poor suckers. So we paid a lot of money and just could barely get the fly out of the boat and into the water. But what we did see while we were out there was a set of boats, a lot of them, heavily fishing for menhaden. Menhaden is a small fish that's called, in that kind of pejorative term, a forage fish. Well, it's a super important fish for whales and, and alewives and all sorts of other things. It's also fished off the coast of Maine for Omega-3 fat acids. Um, now, the fish actually don't make those omega-3 fatty acids. They're made by algae that are ingested and concentrated in the fish. Well, guess what? Brought to you by CSIRO in Australia is canola, which is the source of canola oil or rapeseed, which they have inserted the genetic sequence from the algae so that you can now or will be buying canola oil that is very high in omega-3 fatty acids. And hopefully those folks will stop fishing Manhattan and, uh, and, and the whale wives get to eat it. So here we are. Where does this leave us with conservation? And here we're going to take the glide path out. So here are two headlines. Extinction looms for native bird species on the Hawaiian island of Kauai. Or reckless driving, gene drives, and the end of nature. You have the promise and the peril equally, pr equally promoted by different sides. We have to recognize that we are in a world that is increasingly being ruined by human activities. So this graph, there's no need for you to care about what each one of these are, so we can return to it if you want to. The point, everyone is going up. Every single threat that, that it originates with humanities is getting worse. We seem to be unable to imagine the kind of disruption that synthetic biology is going to bring to us in a variety of fields say agriculture. 
So the first headline, 2014, sugarcane, which has been known quintessentially as a tropical crop, has been genetically altered to be grown in temperate climates. Doubt it's going to be in Maine yet, but it's not going to be far. On the bottom is milk, which never saw a cow. The genetic mechanism for making milk has been moved into yeast, and this is animal-free, perfect day milk. But they're seeking the permission to be marketing it. The disruptions in human medicine. So this young lady, Layla Richards, was dying of a genetically based childhood leukemia. And every single treatment that was tried did failed on her. And doctors asked the parents for permission to try a novel change, actually turning off a genetic sequence within her genome that was responsible for the leukemia. She's now five years old and fine. The disruption in conservation as well. DARPA, if you don't know, it's the defense, it's the defense uh, organization that invests in novel technologies. They currently have a research competition to develop technologies to gen genetically engineer an organism's preference for a niche. That is, to be able to take things that required wet places and they can now grow in dry places, or that required cold places and now they can grow in warmer places, altering some of the most basic ecological aspects. Now. I was raised and born and bred as a conservation biologist. And as a conservationist, my discipline was formed as a self-described crisis discipline. This is the kind of book title that got produced by the people who raised me. 100 animals to see before they die. And how about 500 places to see before they disappear? God forbid that you should be asked to go somewhere and try and prevent it. But rather, this is go there before your friends do so you can claim that you have seen it because it's now gone. Oh, bummer. Guess you'll never go there. It's under the ocean. This is not what we'd like to see as a societal response to a problem. How about this one? <laughs> Brought to you by the great state of Maine. Pamela and I moved into Danforth Street, and this truck was parked across for the first two months we moved in. Imagine that, getting up every single morning. Bye, dear, I'm off to work. No hope. I guess I'm going home now at the end of my full day. No hope. This should have been a conservation biologist who had that truck. I think it probably was a lobster fisherman, or maybe it was somebody who'd gotten divorced. I don't know. You could probably look it up. Hell of a license plate to have, huh? Should have been a conservationist. I am here to tell you that as part of a move to reframe my field, our field, collective field of conservation, that we must engage with synthetic biology and the developers of new technologies across the full range of issues that I've laid in front of you today and probably even more. Because synthetic biology has the potential to be an extraordinarily disruptive technology for conservation, because it forces us to face, we've talked about these, conflicting objectives, conflicting values, the fact that much of our work is dated, and the fact that we don't know what's going to happen when these things are developed. But I'm, I'm here to tell you, I and we are not going to be able to stop the development of synthetic biology. The future of the nature that we wish to conserve will require us to overcome our reluctance. This is the Singapore Botanical Garden. Can you see what's wrong in this picture? So those, those plants are all made out of Legos. But not all of them. You can see the real ones, the Venus flytraps and the Lego ones. I want to make the case to you that we must own the imperative to shape this disruption curve and to embrace the hybrid that we've been discussing and ride the risk in order to influence what will happen. So you may not know, humanities again, seven princes of hell, one of whom was Belphegor. Here he is, doesn't a fine fellow. His particular curse on humanity was to help them make discoveries by seducing them, suggesting ingenious inventions that will make them rich. So at the time that somebody peopled hell with seven princes, they already knew that the kinds of issues that we're facing with synthetic biology are an integral part of the interplay between humans, the natural world, and our ability to discover things. Well, humanities again, when I talk, when I give these kinds of presentations, there are three things people have to say to me. First, I already heard your mouths, watched your mouths move, Monsanto. So we're going to put that aside. These are the other two. They say, 
My God, man, how could you be suggesting this? Haven't you read Frankenstein? Haven't you seen Jurassic Park? And because these two weren't enough for you, coming <laughs> is Rampage, opening April 20th. Now, I love Dwayne Johnson, but read this. Primatologist, don't you love it? The Rock is going to be a primatologist. When a rogue genetic experiment goes wrong, it causes George, a wolf, and a reptile to grow to monstrous sizes. As the mutated beasts embark on a path of destruction, he turns, turn, teams up with a discredited genetic engineer and the military. Rare to have the military in a positive role. To secure an antidote and prevent a global travesty. There is nobody writing a book or making a movie in which the synthetic biologist steps in, pulls off her t-shirt, and emerges and saves the day. It's always the technology that is the responsible for the downfall of human beings. This is not news. So here, here was a, uh, the Victorian belief that a train ride could cause instant insanity. So this is a drawing of a man who murdered his best friend when they went on a train ride for the first time. There was a term called railway madmen. The sounds and the motion of train travel were thought to be so distressing to humankind that they would erupt into these horrible behaviors and slay their best friend. So here we have Raymond Williams. We've come full circle, the same liter literary theorist I, I described at the beginning. And he wrote this extraordinary, I think, important statement. The idea of nature contains, though often unnoticed, an extraordinary amount of human history. Nature will continue to be reconceived. It is up to us to decide how it be, will be redefined to incorporate the kinds of changes that synthetic biology is going to be bringing to our world. I want to end with this by saying I do not consider this to be the end of nature, but yet another start. Thank you very much. One of the first things that came to, to my mind is um, the stink bugs that are here in Maine, and they never used to be here before, and why are they here? And I was just wondering if you knew anything about that, because when you were talking about how um, different things can get introduced to other... Yeah, I actually can answer that stink bug question, um, but typically I can't answer. Don't let that give you any ideas, because usually... I would go home and visit my parents, and my mother's friend would say, you know, my house plant has got this funny stuff on it. You're a biologist. And I could never answer that, and they were always disappointed. But stay, so this is the, there are lots and lots of different species of stink bugs. This is called the marmorated stink bug. And it's, a, it's an introduced pest, and it's particularly dangerous for fruit producers because it mars the fruit by feeding on it. And when Pamela and I lived in Irvington in New York, we were at the leading wave of the movement, and, and they come inside houses looking for warm places in the cold weather. And it used to, you know, you had your favorite pair of wool socks you haven't worn in a while, it's finally have a chilly day, you open them up and out drop two or three of these marmorated stink bugs. So they're an introduced species, but they are moving into colder areas uh, as warmer as, as the climate warms. And I hope you don't have a house plant problem, because that's, <laughs> all like, she used that up. There's a gentleman here. So, so uh, hold on one second, second sir. Oh, sorry. There you go. So what I'm hearing is that there are two learning curves. The learning curve of how we learn how to manipulate these technologies and create virtual or artificial realities that behave in a certain way. And there's a learning curve with, with which we can predict some of the consequences, some of the opportunities, some of the dangers. And it seems that 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 second learning curve is, is slower, so we, we run blindsided into those dangers. If that learning curve were, were faster, if we were ahead of the game, would it be okay? All right, great. So you draw a curve through data points, and we have no data points for the second one of your learning curves, which means the learning is happening at the same time the doing is taking place. And this is what scares, this is what, this is why some people call synthetic biology an existential threat. Um, because if we introduce something like I talked about for the bats, 
with all assurances, all the experimentation would shows, all the modeling shows it should be no problem, and then it turns into a really big problem, it's too late. Except you probably won't try it with the next bat one. So you have a tension going on right now by those people who think that the world is, is, uh, is that nature is going downhill at such a rapid rate that what we should be asking is, would the world get worse if we didn't apply synthetic biology? Or would it get worse if we applied it and it didn't go well? And that's really, that's the counterfactual, right? So people are not good at that comparison. They rather say, well, nature's fine, and if you do this, it's going to ruin everything. Well, I'm sorry, I'm here to tell you that it's already being ruined in many, in many ways to many people. So that's that comparison. You know, that, what you've advocated in the second portion of your remarks is the fail fast. That's the sort of. Advocate, I, I asked. Don't get experiment. Yeah. So, and, and, and the, the learning cycle is much speeded up because of the application of technology to these genetic technologies so that they're actually making parts. The reason the Legos are up here is you can order what amount to genetic Legos and build things. You have a start and a stop and a repeat can order them and put them together. And if that didn't work, you can move seven to three and three to two the way and learn faster as a result of that. So that is the approach that is being advocated by those who are using this. Thank you. I have cash. We'll get to you next. Got a question over here. Go. Okay. Um, my question has to do with um, affordability and how are these technologies going to be afforded by poorer countries? And is it going to be purely manipulated by the, you know, uh, the research R&Ds that are going on in the wealthier countries? Um, particularly, I'm interested in to, to know what would be the impact in the indigenous culture and also places like India and other rural communities where people have lived with the nature, um, quite close to nature, and used everything that they gather in nature. So how is this technology going to help them or not help them at all, because they can't afford it. Uh, so it's a it's a prognostication question, and if if um, typically this is such a a polarized world that I can tell you I can answer your question as an advocate for the technology, and I can answer your question as a as someone who is deeply afraid for the impact of it, and. And we cannot adjudicate between those two versions because we don't know yet. So, I, so let me try the short version of each. So the positive version is that older man and the older woman plowing the field in Rajasthan, in India, are not leading a fulfilled life. They would be regarded in all the aspects of poverty to, you know, voicelessness, powerlessness, fear, lack of economic, lack of health. They would be regarded as probably f suffering under all those dimensions. What could we do to improve the agricultural productivity of their setting to allow at least a portion of that to be improved? So the positivists would say that we can alter a significant set of these crops in order to allow it to be less labor, less input, higher yields, and they have, would have a chance of perhaps being able to earn some money by being able to sell crops. You're probably very familiar that there is a, uh, there's a national brawl going on in India about genetically modified brinjal, the eggplant. Um, it's exactly this point. The argument is that it will help a lot of people who are growing eggplant and want to eat eggplant. And there are others who say this is the beginning of the end of foreign ownership of our, of our germplasm, et cetera. And as you may know, the, the minister who was supposed to sign the final version that would allow the experimentation to go forward died of a heart attack a week before he was to sign this thing. So there's immediately a convict that you know he was killed or poisoned or something. We don't know. 90 plus percent of the edible oils in this country come from genetically modified corn and soybean. It is in everything. I, I guarantee you that within the last week, you have consumed a genetically modified oil. There is no evidence of anybody's ill health as the result of it. 
yet there are a set of people who are convinced. We were just talking at the art gallery. There's an interesting piece, Stonyfield, Stonyfield Yogurt has issued a commercial that uses children to tell you how awful genetically modified products are. And, and, and there's now a fight about whether you can use children to do that, whether you're delivering science through eight-year-old girls, what that means. And I don't know whether people are going to want to go there. Um, so the, the indigenous people's part, I don't think there's any particular difference um, from the category of resource user anywhere else. I have a, a, a Maori colleague from New Zealand who, who has spoken with Maori elders who feel that these things are not a problem as far as their cosmology goes. I was in a meeting in Australia in September with a young Maori fellow who said these things are terrible. As a Maori, we can't possibly support these. So I don't, you know, I don't think there's a single indigenous perspective, not surprisingly, on these technologies. But these are the right questions to be asking. Here we go third row center here. Um, back about 20 years ago, I heard um, a woman, a sociologist in Montpelier, Vermont, and one of the things she said has stuck with me. And she said, I do not mean to stereotype, because not all men are alike, not all women are alike. Some are more like the other than the other is like them. But she said, I have come across a thing to be aware of. If you want the answer to a question devoid of context, ask a man. If you want the answer to a question swimming in context, ask a woman. Now, there are exceptions. Don't stereotype it. And she said, and don't think that one is necessarily right. One of the issues for women, for example, is swimming in context about worrying about every decision they make and the impact it's going to have. Sometimes they can't act. Whereas men supposedly tend to be very, get the task done, get the job done. And we remember about Steve Jobs when he was confronted with, do you know how your products are made? Do you know the, the and he said, basically, I don't give a, hmm, that's not my, that's not why I'm here. I'm here to build this wonderful, beautiful machine that will be user friendly. And so I, you know, for me, it, I, there's such a big gender issue here, and again, it's not universal because there are many men who are more like women and women like men um, in their thinking and their way of understanding that. But it's when are we going to get the boys, which isn't all men, to stop making more toys? I mean, it's just it's it's a sin, literally a sin, the way we are despoiling the earth. And it's because, you know, what we've got is never enough. It's never enough. It's never enough. And honest to God, I think if the universe or the earth were in the hands of women, we would not have a lot of what we have going on now. And I'm glad to see the rise of that and the supportive men who are partnering with us. So um, there's a lot in that. I, I think it's really... <laughs> Unpack that. I think it's really an opinion, so I want to celebrate you're having the opinion. I would like to let you know that some of the most enthusiastic advocates that I have met for these technologies are women. And the two people I know that are the biggest opponents of these globally are men. I know that. That's why. So, and, and I also would say, right, it's New York Fashion Week this week. You know, there are women who are wanting more stuff as well. So I, I don't want to belittle that. It, it's just not a male. It's just it's not only a male characteristic. I, I think historically it has been, but it's not. That's not only the problem. Changing gears a little bit. Um, I, I admittedly am, I'm not aware, particularly in the public domain, some of the these labs that you were saying that folks could just kind of show up and start playing around, or you could buy them on Amazon. And I'm just kind of curious, um, you know, from a public health standpoint, you know, just in terms of from your experience, have there been <coughs> concerns raised because you, people with just a little bit of knowledge can do dangerous things? So I'm just kind of curious. I'm really kind of struck by that when I, when I was thinking about that. And anybody, anywhere, you said, could we could all go home and, and start doing Good. things tonight. So I'm just interested to know, learn a little bit more about, uh, about that field. 
So when I first started attending meetings in 2013 about this topic, there frequently was a very well-dressed but very conservatively dressed man or woman who sat in the room and never said anything. And uh, after a couple of these meetings, the, one of these people introduced themselves and they're FBI agents. The FBI did a scenario, a formal scenario analysis of how the US government should respond to the development of synthetic biology. And they decided that the, if, they, if the US government tried to strictly regulate this technology, that they would drive it into the dark areas, into labs, into the dark zones, et cetera. And that instead, they would open liaison offices. And so there are FBI agents who reach out and are part of community discussions, broad, broad consultatives, attend meetings, visit labs, talk to kids, because they have decided that they are more likely to learn that, that self-reporting is going to be a much more likely source of a way of controlling the technologies than trying to legislate against them. Now that being said, you cannot, if you sent in a request for anthrax, the genetic sequence for anthrax, the companies that provide genetic sequences would report you. But you may have seen that it's possible to build the smallpox vaccine. They built it, even though that's illegal to ship it, it was built by buying pieces in and building it because somebody wanted to show that this could be done. So, so we are in a place where the, you have the consolidation and the fight of businesses for patents, and you have a very strong social movement to try and democratize this and have it open access and self-patrolling. Um, and we're back to our learning curve. We're going to find out how this is going. But you can get a YouTube and you can do apply CRISPR yourself. You could go there and do it tonight. <laughs> Amaze your friends. Come back with two provosts. <laughs> hey. <laughs> hey, look. <laughs> but only one president, that's all. <laughs> only. Don't try making another president at home. <laughs> the reason it's called uni is because there's only one president. Kent, we have a question back here. Oh. Damn, I was just, oh, it's Bethany, okay. <laughs> I Hi, Beth. um, You did a wonderful job of kind of walking the line between I'm terrified of this and I'm excited about its potential. You said we need to ride the wave, quote unquote. I'm really wondering what you think that looks like. That doesn't mean completely whole hog accepting anything that, you know, anybody in the whole world would want to do with this technology. And yet you've just talked about the problems of controlling it. So how do we, how in your opinion, as the person I know who's thought about this more than anyone else, you know, I know, how do you picture us walking the line of riding the wave, um, but also protecting our public health and our environmental health? So the first thing I do, if I were the provost or the president, would, <laughs> would establish a course at this university yeah. that is not a, a major's course, but is in the humanities or in the social sciences. Because all of these are questions that need to be asked and need to be raised. And we have to educate people about these. I'm not about telling you what to think about it. I am about telling you to think about it. Because otherwise it's going to happen and you're going to say, Jesus, how come nobody checked with me? Well, I'm here to tell you. You can influence this. So more directly to your question, Bethany. So through the course of engaging you know, with the FBI agents and their ilk, uh, I got invited to put together a session on conservation at the World Congress of Synthetic Biologists that was held in Singapore in June. So there were 700, you know, hardcore lab scientists, and I got a slot to have five people talk to them about this stuff, environmental implications. And then I asked for a breakout session for anybody who wanted to talk about these things more. We had standing room only, and there wasn't a person who was over 30 in that room. And mostly, and from all over the world, particularly Chinese, I mean, it's partially because in Singapore, 
And they wanted to know, as developers of these technologies, what they could do to help. That's what I think we have to do, is stop making it about them, the developers, and us, the ones who are going to be receiving this technology, either joyously or under duress, and say, you know, there's some things we're deeply worried about. Can you try to make sure that you don't do this? Or we have a problem. You think you might be able to help us with that and actually socialize synthetic biology into the larger society so that nobody will be able to say later on, but if only we had talked to them. That's what I'd like each one of you to go call up a synthetic biologist tonight. Sure. <laughs> we have a gentleman. Tell oh, them you're worried. No, it's quite all right. We have a gentleman here in front. Yep. Oh, good evening. Uh, what, in your opinion, is some of the more traditional aspects of conservation biology that practitioners should be pushing? I mean, when I hear you talk about uh, mentioning being able to alter the niche of an animal, let's say, should we still be pushing habitat conservation? Take something like a bog turtle, which is very species specific and doesn't necessarily have any direct human use. If you can engineer them not to live in a calcareous fen, but rather in a dry environment in Australia, is that, does that suffice? Or is, is it essentially the same thing when you do that? Is it still a bog turtle? Is it still a bog turtle? And, and should we, some of these traditional, why we can do a lot with some of this emerging technology, it does, it does have a lot of potential to do good with species recovery and things like that. But what are, what are some of the more traditional things that conservation biologists that have been doing that we still should be doing? So the British newspapers in the f early fall carried a set of articles saying that it was going to be a, a bad winter, and so everyone should be feeding the birds. You should put out more bird feeders and get more bird seed. So the, we, we are, the Brits, are living in a world in which the response to human-caused climate change is to up the subsidy that we're providing to nature. So are those birds the same birds as the ones who, who would have been subjected to a winter without any feed? I don't know. But that's the hybrid question we're talking about. So to your question, the first thing I'd ask from my colleagues in the conservation world is stop being so depressive. <laughs> we think, so this is my version of this. I, I don't know if any of you who experienced the 1960s American ugly tourist abroad who went to France, let's say, and said, you know, the, oui, monsieur, arrives the garçon. And, the guy says, coffee. The guy says, como? <laughs> and he says, coffee. <laughs> and he still doesn't get what he wants. Because we think that by saying something louder, that we have a better chance of communicating with people. So what does that have to do with conservation? It's the sixth extinction. That's what we have to say to the public. And you know what the public's response is, right? They go shopping. I'm sorry, but they go shopping. Um, so. That's what I would like, generically, of my conservation colleagues, is to realize that what the psychologists who studied climate change communication say, that if you produce enough depressing information, people abandon the topic and, and don't want to think about it anymore. We haven't, we haven't learned that lesson. So I, didn't, I don't think there's anything that is a traditional tool in the conservation community that, should, that we should stop doing. But I think we have to create more porous definitions about what what our ultimate, what our objectives are, and how we're going to measure them. So that uh, Jack Pine example with the Kirtland's warbler, you know, what is it? How much subsidy are we going to be giving, or are we going to be willing to do to keep that bird there? And currently, we have had, we have no capacity to triage and say, I'm sorry, bog turtles, you know. This world is not just going, is not going to be one in which bog turtles are going to be there. And bog turtles are a good example for that. So we're not, you know, we're going to give you a party and say goodbye. Nobody wants to say that, but we're doing it de facto. So we might as well own up to it and talk to people about it. President Herbert, I can't oh, resist. The president, oh, this is <laughs> this is this is fantastic. This is really a great presentation. So thank you so much. Um, I'm just struck by. Uh, 
two points. One you already made, which is the counterfactual, is that it's, it's a false dichotomy to think that doing nothing is an option. We've already intervened to the point that um, even if humans disappeared today, uh, the world is, is going to be here to four a very, very different place than it would have been otherwise. And so um, it's, it's really a choice between doing what we're already doing right now, the status quo, and seeing what happens, taking our chances that way versus trying to intervene, and in both cases with a lot of unknowns. Um, what strikes me is the importance, and you touched on this, but I just wanted to underscore it, the importance of um, uh, perhaps a new field, which is a, a form of ethics, looking at uh, trying to anticipate what these questions are and looking at them exactly the example you just gave, and the parallel with the rise of AI. Um, AI, there's no way we're ever going to go backwards, right? AI continues to march on, and no, the, the question of the pace may be debated, but it's only going to go in one direction. And it poses questions that we have no choice but to address. If you build a driverless car, you know, how do you prioritize the life of the driver versus the life of the folks? And, and that's a question that in the past we could ignore. We can't ignore it anymore. If you're programming it, you have to think a priori. You have to make those decisions, and it's, it's the same here. So maybe what we need to go along with all of this is a new field of ethics that really tries to very explicitly address these questions across disciplines, synthetic biology being one, but um, the rise of digital technologies being the other. Yes. So first a serious answer and then an anecdote. Um, so maybe UNE is the first source of the graduates for this <laughs> program. And I mean, there already is enough material in here not to throw other stuff, but that's an extremely important point. Synthetic biology is not advancing independent of other technologies. And, and artificial intelligence is, is a very significant one. Nanotechnology is another one. And these things are already meeting each other in extraordinary ways, which only makes it more complicated, because how are you learning about just synthetic biology when all of a sudden artificial intelligence is already being used because it's an engineering tool to better engineer the genetic material? So they do need to be brought together, and it is, it is it's the birthright of the humanities to do that kind of thing and not let it all be about 17th century Italian literature or, you know, my God, man. So the anecdote, if I may. <laughs> so when you said AI, right, I, I was raised up in a zoo community where AI is artificial insemination. <laughs> <laughs> and I was visited by my co great good college friend who was doing his PhD um, in artificial intelligence but working with children. So he came to this zoo happy hour. Some, there was a pause, as happens with groups, and somebody asked him what he was doing, and he said he was doing AI with three-year-olds. <laughs> and the zoo community, I mean, it was just this dead stop. I said, no, that's not what he means. So and that's where my head went. But, but I tried, tried to get serious about this. So. But right, all of those technologies are, are joining us. Right here. Thanks, Kent, for a great talk. Um, following up on that question, I'm wondering at these meetings, are, are there also ethicists who are participating in them, or are you finding more it's a case of, of increasing transdisciplinarity where some synthetic biologists, some, are starting to ask those kinds of ethical questions and, and learn the ethics as they go along, or do you find an ethical con conversation and, and a whole new field already there and being present in these discussions. So thanks, Rick. Um, the ethicists have swarmed to um, de-extinction like fruit flies to rotting bananas. And part of my frustration is the much of the discussion you find out in New York Times and Atlantic and what have you about synthetic biology has collapsed in on de-extinction. Oh, you know, should we be re reintroducing mammoths or regrowing mammoths? Well, and I'm not against it. I'm for it. And so I'm a, there's a movie now about recreating mammoths. And, and yet, so all of this that you've asked about, all of the role of women and the role of agriculture and how it's going to impact indigenous people and any, all of that stuff <coughs> is, is getting largely ignored by ethicists who don't want to talk about, well, I mean, if you brought the mammoth back, would it really be a mammoth? And what would you tell it about its mother? 
because it doesn't have a mother. But its mother was an Indian elephant, but he didn't want to admit it because it's a mammoth. It just came through the birth of an Indian elephant. And he said, really? And what would you do it? And if you put it in a zoo, would people pay to come in? And if they saw it, would it be a freak? And if it's a freak, does it belong in the zoo? And you can, you can teach a whole course just by reading the ethical stuff. In the meanwhile, you know, should India allow genetically modified eggplants? The ethics of that, or what's the role of women as developers in terms of and consumers of these technologies, it's just nobody seems to want to do it, which is why it's so important to stimulate it across this broader front and just not let it, as I said when talking about it, be this bijou thing that, I mean, there are more books about recreating mammoths and, and articles written about them, and all this stuff got, got left out as the stepchildren of that discussion. So I think you could find the people who are interested in it that kind of need to be stimulated, I think, to do that. Now, what there is is science and technology studies, people who are swarming all over this stuff, particularly in the UK, but also Sheila Jasanoff, who's at Harvard, who's a dean of this. She's all over this stuff. She wrote a fabulous book called The Ethics of Invention, um, which is a really great uh, book. So there's some good Good course material if you if you wanted to do it, and some people who you could get into that topic. I think they're not there now. I have a couple of basic questions. Uh, your quote in Raymond Williams reminds me of another literary critic, Terry Eagleton. In one of his books, he talks about the concept of culture, usually uh, used in opposition to the word nature, but he reminds us of the agricultural origins of the word culture. You know, people forget. The, that culture, in fact, is part of the natural process. And so, <laughs> and this leads me to the question, in what ways is synthetic biology not natural? Uh, it is as unnatural as backyard bird feeders. I mean, I, so I used to think I could define the word nature, and, and I don't even try anymore. But your question demands that I, that I define it. No, I mean, the, 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 the follow-up question would be, when did the opposition of the dichotomy nature versus culture appear? Is it a romantic movement? Because I, yes. is, is there any trace of it in the medieval period that you find that people, you know, uh, juxtaposing nature to culture or something like He's that? He's outing me as not a... No, no, I'm just saying, I'm just curious. No. Um, I believe that some of the early Latin texts, many of you probably haven't read them, actually addressed this. In fact, they were the, it came into Latin from Ar the Arabic, which was, which was then assumed by early Portuguese scientists. And it, no, I think, I mean, because I don't, I, all, yeah, all I can speak from is the kind of Western, largely English-based um, response to that, and certainly the people who write on this locate this in during the Romantic period, the Lake Country, and and Wadsworth, and Pamela's an English major, and she understood all of this stuff right away. Oh yeah, that's you know this poem about this or that, and and that started to separate humans from the natural world, and and I think the conservation. I mean, you saw that talk. My talk is I I am a product of that Romantic tradition, and I am a. I am here in this kind of Dr. Phil way of, of offering you <laughs> my life experience in yeah. front of you to say that wasn't, it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. But it would be super interesting to ask in other traditions where, yeah. where this happens. And certainly in indigenous traditions, this, this dichotomy just doesn't exist. This is the last question. I'd be interested to know uh, how some of the conservation groups of scale, some of whom you sounds like you may have worked for, Nature Conservancy and so forth, how those folks are uh, taking your message. And if they're going to put, let's say, a 20,000 acre project um, in, the, in their, the forefront of their sites, I mean, What's your advice to them to, in, in terms of how they should consider or use uh, synthetic biology? I mean, some of these projects, they're saving this land to just keep it, keep it natural. Um, or maybe they're after a particular species, they probably are. But, but what would, what's your experience been in, in terms of how the, the heavies, the heavy con traditional conservation groups are, are uh, accepting uh, synthetic biology and 
Uh, they think I'm a heretic. <laughs> they don't. So I gave an earlier version of this talk at World Wildlife Fund US in Washington, DC, and they streamed it. And they had, I they didn't tell me how many, they said a number of people who, who canceled their membership in World Wildlife Fund for sponsoring somebody who was willing to raise these topics. So there's a problem we've got. Um, and you know, Wildlife Conservation Society, where I worked for 14 years, supported the first of these meetings, has its name on the origins of these discussions and doesn't want to have anything to do with this. Um, and the, re the reason is we're too busy. I mean, I, s I referred to this. We're too busy trying to save things. We don't have time. Show me what this problem is. Show me somebody who's going to fund me to do something about this. And there isn't anything to do now except learn and, and talk to people. So I mean, this is perhaps too, too detailed. But we have a kind of mothership organization called IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And they have agreed by 2020 to propose a position on this topic, um, a globally held position on this issue. And they've asked me to run the process to try to develop that. And that's going to demand that all these groups that are members of that organization are going to have to vote for or against whatever this position is. So I think only then is it going to really kind of be forced, oh my god, the delegates, you have to brief me. What am I going to say about this? Um, it, it hasn't been a very positive experience. But I you know, spent 20 years in that world. I understand you literally don't have the resources to even do what you're trying to do, let alone take on something that isn't even a problem yet. But thank you for the question. Thank you so much. Thank you.